Hi everyone. Didn't I say recently that you can never have too many scene transition effects? I've just created another one that can also be customized in interesting ways. So it's basically three effects in one. Let's take a look at how such a shader works. And as with all transition effects, we'll need a scene with an image to which we'll apply our shader and then the target image as a parameter. So I'll prepare everything in the usual way. Right clicking the scene folder, scenes, uh, create new scene, 2D scene, and let's call it dot transition. Okay. And I'll drag the usual image, which should be right here, found in JPEG. So the Sprite 2D uh, node was automatically created. And in the inspector, let's open offset and cancel centered. Then let's open transform and cancel position, reset to <coughs> zero, 0, Scrolling down to the material section, let's create a new shader material, click it and create a new shader which is called dot transition GD shader type shader mode canvas item and I'll put it to the shaders folder and click create and click it again to open it in the shader editor. Okay, so as we know from uh, previous tutorials, we work only with the fragment function, uh, which means we can delete everything else from the generated code, deleting vertex and deleting white. Okay, and we can start coding. As I said, we'll insert the target image into the shader as a parameter. So that's the line I'll begin with right here. A uniform sample 2D target, and I'll give it the hint, hint default black, which means that if I don't <clears throat> add anything to the parameter, uh, this uh, texture will be displayed as a black texture. Uh, but of course, uh, it would be better to use it right now. So we can see it in the inspector shader parameters target and I'll drag Chapel JPEG into it. Good. So uh, we'll get to the other uniform parameters as I write the code. So for now, let's move to the fragment function. First, I'll insert the usual basic structure, assigning the UV coordinates and recalculating the aspect ratio so that the transition effect always looks the same, regardless of the image dimensions. So deleting this comment and now vec2 uh, UV is UV. And then the aspect ratio. So first we need the resolution, which will take from the texel dimensions resolution is one divided by texture pixel size and the recalculation uvx is multiplied by resolution x divided by resolution y okay Let's continue. We know that the transition effects require mixing the original and the new image. And for each pixel, we calculate a weight coefficient for this mix. At this stage, I'll use a constant value and later replace it with the real calculation. It will look like this. Uh, float weight is for now just zero. And now the mix back for color is the mix function of texture, our background image texture and UV, then texture of our target image and UV again and the weight coefficient. Okay, <clears throat> and finally let's assign it to the output which is the color in capital letters. Notice that when reading from both images, we use the original UV coordinates of the current pixel, that is UV in uppercase. If we used the transformed UV in lowercase instead, the image would be distorted due to the aspect ratio adjustment. You always need to be careful about which coordinates you use where. Let's just show it, UV in lowercase, 
and we can see how it <laughs> turned to a square. So let's revert that to UV in uppercase. Okay, so I think it's time to add a second uniform parameter, which will control the transition between the images. Uniform float face, uh, float face with a hint range, and the face starts at zero, the original image, from zero to one, and uh, step point zero one. Okay, and we can assign it to the variable weight. So instead of zero, let's use face. Okay, let's display the whole image. And now, when I change the parameter in the inspector, we can see how the original image gradually changes into the target one. Okay, but of course, we won't be satisfied with something this primitive. We need to use a function that computes a value for each pixel so that we can get the effect we saw at the beginning of the video. So once again, I'll switch to my favorite tool, Desmos, where we'll discover this function step by step. And here it is. We are in a web browser and the URL is desmos.com. Com. It is a great tool for visualizing function graphs, and I usually use it as uh, usually <laughs> I usually use it in its 2D version. This one. This time, however, I'll switch to 3D because we'll be creating a three-dimensional graph of values over the x-y plane, which corresponds to the UV coordinates in our shader. So right here in the top right corner, I click and switch to 3D calculator. This is very nice. So, let's start with a simple trigonometric function. Z equals cosine of, eh, shit, x. Okay, so we can see that the graph matches the typical shape of the cosine function along the x-axis, while along the y-axis, it's constant. So, let's add y to our function cosine x plus cosine y. Okay, and we can see uh, that the wave is now two-dimensional, and we can also freely rotate the graph. And if we look at it from the above, like this, we can see that the resulting pattern exactly matches what we saw in our effect at the beginning of the video. So now uh, I'll just need to animate it so we can simulate the transition effect. For this, <clears throat> it will be very useful to add parameters that we can change using a slider. First, I'll add the parameter g for grid, which will change the frequency of the cosine function, that is, the size of these individual tilted squares. It would be, look like this, so x times g and y times g, and click to add slider g. All right, and let's uh, fix the range. It should go from one to let's say 20. Okay, and now when I drag the slider, we can see how it changes the frequency. Great, let's get back. Okay, and to achieve the transition, it's enough for the entire graph to shift along the z-axis, which causes the effect surface uh, to gradually hide and reveal. I'll do this with parameter p, which represents the phase of the transition. So plus B and click again to add the slider. And now when I change it, we can see how it submerges and then surfaces again. I can also tilt the camera view, uh, the camera to view this effect from the side. Let's try it again, down and up. Perfect, and that's all we need from Desmos. And now I'll rewrite the resulting function, this one, into the shader in the Godot editor. So I'm clicking back to Godot. And first, we need to add the parameter that I labeled G in Desmos. There, we used the same value for, for both X and Y. While in the shader, it might be useful to adjust each value separately. So I'll add two uniform parameters, grid X and grid Y. 
So let's do it here. Uh, uniform float grid x with a hint range and the initial value 100 is a good one. And it should go from 1 to, let's say, 500. And the step is 1. OK, this is the x value. And now the y value would be exactly the same. So I copy paste this line and just change it to grid y. OK, and now we can rewrite the definition of the variable weight. Where is it? Right here. So that it matches the function from decimal. So instead of phase, uh, phase will stay there. But before that, we'll use the cosine function. Cos uv dot x times grid x plus cosine uv dot y times grid y and plus face. OK, we can see something. And it seems our effect has somewhat blurry edges. So we'll sharpen them using one more parameter, which I call sharpness. Let's add it here. Uniform float sharpness. Let's give it a hint range and the initial value let's set to 10. Eh, 10 I said. OK, and the hint range will go from 1 to for instance, uh, 20. And this time, let's keep the step point 01. OK, 01, I said this one. <laughs> Very well. And we'll apply the sharpening using the power function, which is the most suitable for that. So scrolling back to white, and let's fix it this, this way. Weight equals po of weight. Eh. Weight and sharpness. OK, wait for it. Very well. Now our effect has sharper edges. But there is still one problem. As we can see, the pixels are overexposed, which is caused by the weight value uh, exceeding the 0 to 1 range expected by the mix function. So I'll clamp these values using the clamp function. Let's wrap clamp around it, clamp this and the, the range, 0, 1. OK, there. Now it's fine. But when I change the face parameter in the inspector, we'll notice that the transition isn't complete. This is because we set the hint range uh, from 0 to 1 while the sum of two cosine functions, this and this, the sum uh, can take values from negative 2 to 2. So we need to expand our hint range. I found that setting its range to negative 2 and 3 um, works best. And I'll change the um, the default value to negative 2 as well and fix it in the inspector, clicking here to revert to negative 2. OK, and let's try it again. So where is it face? And dragging. Now it's correct. And we are done with the entire shader. However, at the beginning of the video, I promised three effects in one. And now I can finally show what I meant. The first effect, the transition using uh, expanding dots, we've just seen. But if I set the grid x parameter to its minimum value, uh, why is it 5? Sorry, it should be 500. Eh. This is correct. OK, so uh, once again, when I set a grid x to its minimum value to one, we get a transition made of horizontal rounded stripes. Let's see it. Can you see it? OK, and similarly, if I return grid x to uh, the original value and lower grid y to one, we will see a vertical stripes. That looks quite useful, don't you think? And what about the third effect? Let's try lowering both parameters to 1. So this is the first one. 
and then we'll see something like a simple page flip. Did you see it? I'll make it slowly. Okay. And that's everything. You may come up with more modifications, but this is where I will stop just returning the parameters. And now we are back to the dot transition. Thank you very much for watching. And I hope you will find a good use even for such a simple shader. As I said at the beginning, you can never have too many scene transition effects. And if we understand their principles well, they can be a foundation for more advanced experiments. A suitable visualization often helps a lot. So I definitely recommend using Desmos whenever you are unsure about the behavior of a more complex function. For now, Take care, good luck with your game projects, and I'll see you in the next video.